Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. British Prime Minister Liz Truss has announced the end of her term after just over six weeks in office. Her resignation follows calls from her own party to step down. Arizona pushing back against the federal government, saying it'll keep its border fix in place until the feds do something to fill the gaps in the border wall. Florida is preparing for early voting to start next week. Election officials are publicly testing their voting machines. Using biological men to promote makeup products for women. Two companies are being criticized for their promo campaigns. One of the companies says they believe beauty is for everyone. The CDC voting today on a step that could lead to COVID vaccine requirements for school children. Find out what an expert has to say about the safety of vaccines for kids. UK Prime Minister Liz Truss is resigning. She made the announcement today after just 44 days in office. Truss spoke outside the door of her number 10 Downing Street office. I recognize though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Members of Truss's own party have increasingly called on her to step down after she was forced to abandon most of her economic plans. The program, when announced on September 23rd, sent the pound and government bond markets tumbling, resulting in the Bank of England stepping in with emergency measures. This was followed by a politically catastrophic U-turn in government policy. Truss said a leadership election will be completed by next week and that she will stay in office until a successor has been chosen. Those expected to run in the new leadership election include former finance minister Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt, a former defense minister. Heading back stateside, Arizona is pushing back against the federal government. The state is refusing to take down shipping containers that are filling gaps along the border, even after the federal government said they were illegal. NTD's Jessica Beatty has more. Arizona says it cannot rely on the federal government to ensure its security at the border. And until the federal government shares specifics about its plan to fill gaps at the border, the state will keep the shipping containers in place. Back in August, Arizona placed around 120 shipping containers along border gaps in Yuma County, the state's busiest illegal border crossing area. The containers are double stacked and topped with razor wire. At the time, the governor said Arizona had had enough and couldn't wait any longer for the gaps to be filled. Then last week, the Department of Interior's Bureau of Reclamation wrote a letter to the state saying the unauthorized placement of the containers was illegal and a trespass against the United States. The letter, reported by 12 News, said that trespass is harming federal lands and resources and impeding Reclamation's ability to perform its mission. Some of the containers are near a dam. A bureau spokesperson told Fox News it needs access to make sure the dam's infrastructure is sound. The letter comes as Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, announced its own plan to close the border gaps. It plans to use temporary mesh fencing and vehicle gates so they can access the river. But CBP won't start construction until early next year. Arizona responded to the Bureau's letter, arguing that the Constitution allows states to defend themselves and the regulation cited does not prohibit Arizona's actions. The back and forth comes as tensions have soared between the Biden administration and Republican-led border states. They disagree over border policies that have seen a surge in illegal immigration. Arizona says it's been waiting for border construction since last December and it will work with federal partners when they provide specific details. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Over in Georgia, Governor candidate Stacey Abrams, who is endorsed by President Biden, said abortion could help mitigate the cost of inflation. When asked if the president agreed with Abrams' position, White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre declined to comment. In Georgia... The president's endorsed candidate for governor, Stacey Abrams, is suggesting that one, may, one way to mitigate the effects of inflation is to get an abortion. Does President Biden agree? Uh, I did not see her comments on this, so I don't know the context of this. Again, I want to be careful because this is a political debate uh, and it, it's related to a midterm and election. Uh, so I, this is, I'm not going to comment on that. 
Abortion has been a key platform in Abrams' gubernatorial campaign. Asked if Georgians are more concerned about the cost of living pressures under inflation, Abrams insisted that abortion is part of the equation. She said having a child is an economic issue. Her primary opponent, incumbent Governor Brian Kemp, accused Abrams of wanting abortion without limits to fix inflation. Senator Ted Cruz echoed his criticism, saying that ending a person's life isn't the solution for inflation. Ohio vote elections. Currently, the state constitution does not explicitly limit voting to citizens. The village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, passed a referendum in 2019 allowing residents who were not U.S. citizens to vote in local elections. Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose responded by saying, quote, Just when you thought 2020 couldn't get any weirder, the village of Yellow Springs forces me, as Ohio's chief elections officer, to restate the obvious, only U.S. citizens may vote. And speaking of elections, Democratic Senate nominee John Fetterman of Pennsylvania has the all clear from his doctor. After having a stroke back in May, he released a medical report Wednesday with a note from a doctor saying he's recovering well and has no work restrictions. Fetterman has faced a number of questions about transparency surrounding his health and recovery. He still has some hearing difficulty, but his doctor says his speech is normal. Fetterman is also taking medicine for his heart and to prevent future strokes. And Florida is preparing for the November midterms. Election officials in the state's most populous county are testing voting equipment before early voting starts. Let's take a look. Election officials in Miami-Dade County, Florida, held a public event to test their voting machines on Wednesday. They say they do this test prior to every election and it applies to every voting unit. In addition to that, we do what's called the logic and accuracy test, which is what we're doing here today. This is a random sample of the units that are going to be deployed for the November 8th general election, where we invite the public and the candidates and the political parties to come in and observe what it is that we do so that they too can have that extra confidence that the results are accurate. Both Democratic and Republican observers attended the process. Our job is to make sure that elections are run honestly in Miami-Dade County. And we think that Christina White and her staff have been doing a great job in running honest elections. But as President Reagan said, trust but verify. So we're here to verify. Miami-Dade runs Florida's largest elections operation with over 1.5 million registered voters. So many safeguards in place, right? It starts with the fact that the voter rolls have been nev- never have been more accurate and up to date. It is constant list, list maintenance that we are doing. Um, we've spent significant money in both physical security and cybersecurity upgrades over the last few years. The entire state of Florida uses a paper ballot, and so we have actual record of every single vote if we ever needed to go back to that. And we've had many recounts where we have had to, and that has also proven that the, that the election is accurate. The Miami-Dade County election supervisor has a message to voters in the county. So if you're a voter in Miami-Dade County that has a vote-by-mail ballot, I'm urging you to get the ballot back to us as soon as possible. Don't wait until Election Day. Um, And if you like to vote in person, early voting starts on Monday. Uh, There's 28 sites all throughout the county, open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. It's never been more convenient. There's really no reason to wait till Election Day anymore. And so the message here is to do it early. Florida's early voting will begin Monday, October 24th and continue through Sunday, November 6th. And staying in Florida, the state has adopted a new transgender policy. All public schools have to alert parents before allowing any student to use restrooms or locker rooms that don't match their sex at birth. The Florida Board of Education approved the new rule at a meeting on Wednesday. Now, if a school wants to designate transgender or all gender facilities, the school must first post the proposal on its website and email all parents. What's more, the school must at least tell parents exactly which restrooms or locker rooms won't be separated by sex and what kind of supervision will be in place to ensure the safety and privacy of students. In other news, two giants in the makeup industry are under fire by women for using transgender models to promote their beauty products. One of the companies says the objective was to feature conversations that widen the lens around traditional beauty standards. Makeup company Ulta Beauty produced a podcast featuring a transgender host and guest for one of its campaigns. Both are men who identify as women. Even so, the 25-year-old guest, who's a TikTok influencer, talks about his experiences of buying tampons as a woman and more. Here you can see a short clip of the podcast in question. 
now I know I can find love. I know I can still be a performer. I know that I can have a family. I want to be a mom one day. Yeah. And I absolutely can. And that's why the narrative still has a long way to go. Because Being asked about the controversial campaign, Ulta Beauty told the Epic Times, the premise of The Beauty Of is to feature conversations that widen the lens surrounding traditional beauty standards. The intersectionality of gender identity is nuanced, something David and Dylan acknowledge themselves within the episode. Regardless of how someone identifies, they deserve our respect. However, some women said they were offended by the use of two biological men to promote women's beauty products. Why didn't you get a woman on? We are your market, are we not? Makeup company Estee Lauder came under similar fire for using a biological male who says he identifies as a woman in this marketing video. My name is Cricket Temple. I'm a scientist for the Estee Lauder companies. I am transgender. My favorite part of being a woman is living in full color. One person responded to the promotion saying, now Estee Lauder, along with Ulta Beauty, is parading a man around in woman face, talking about what it means to be a woman. This is no better than blackface. This is a dude. They won't define a woman, call us birthing people, and now caricature men as women? Estee Lauder was the first cosmetic company to introduce a men's line of beauty products. It launched its Skin Supplies for Men in 1976. NTD reached out to Estee Lauder for comment, but didn't hear back before broadcast. Next, we get some analysis on the CDC's actions that could lead to COVID-19 vaccine requirements for school children in some states. We hear from a leading expert on COVID-19 treatment to learn more. Joining us now is Dr. Peter McCullough, author of The Courage to Face COVID-19, Preventing Hospitalization and Death While Battling the Biopharmaceutical Complex. Great to have you on the show today, Dr. McCullough. Thanks for having me. CDC advisors will vote today on whether to add COVID-19 vaccines to the child immunization schedule. What's your perspective on whether or not this vaccine should be added? You know, I see patients with COVID-19 in my practice over the course of the last three years, including uh, giving advice on younger children. The disease is characteristically mild, is easily treated, and so the vaccines are not medically necessary. Uh, they're not clinically indicated, and we don't have any assurances that these are going to be safe over the short or even longer term. I, as a cardiologist, I have great concerns over myocarditis. A paper by Mansugin and colleagues from Thailand, the first prospective cohort study, showed a rate of 2.3 percent of damage occurring to the hearts in children ages 13 to 18 who took the COVID-19 vaccine, and that's just with one shot. So I'm greatly concerned uh, that this decision is off the rails. Uh, these uh, vaccines are still experimental and they shouldn't be brought into the vaccine schedule. Heart damage, that just sounds like a very serious issue. Now, what about the efficacy? Have these doses has been tested? The uh, original uh, vaccines, which are now uh, obsolete, coded against the Wuhan spike protein, uh, Moderna and Pfizer had pediatric dosing. There was great concern, actually, children uh, closer to age 12 would be getting too much. But those vaccines uh, vaccines are, are obsolete, and now the new bivalent booster vaccines have never been tested in humans at all, neither adults or children. So I, I can't imagine what's going to come out on the schedule with respect to the series of injections, the schedule of when they're given, and then which ones, because the bivalent vaccines have never been tested in any human beings. And just help me understand here, Dr. McCullough, what are bivalent vaccines? The bivalent vaccines are the new vaccines, which are half of the, the formula is still against the extinct Wuhan spike protein, and half of the formula is directed against uh, the common elements of the BA4 and BA5 uh, subvariants of Omicron. So these bivalent vaccine boosters, they failed in animal studies. They were approved anyway for adults. Now the real quandary is what does, uh, you know, what does happen with the pediatric vaccine schedule. All this adds up to these vaccines in no way should be added to a routine schedule. I think what's going to happen is parents are going to lose trust. And if they lose trust, they may back out of the entire vaccine schedule for children. Do you see any issues with the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986 that you think need to be amended? That act uh, provided a, a liability shield for the manufacturers. 
it was during a period of time when uh, vaccines were being developed and promulgated. At this point in time, the vaccines are so sufficiently t tested and in human use, uh, that act should be uh, dissolved at this point in time. The vaccine manufacturers should be held fully liable in cases where children are injured from vaccines. Dr. Peter McCullough, cardiologist and epidemiologist, thank you so much for your time today. I know you're calling in from your vacation, very diligent. Thank you. Coming up, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a century-old shipwreck is revealed by the Mississippi River's low water level. Experts say the current drought could bring more discoveries. We have that and more just after this break. Over in Texas, mysterious GPS disruptions are spreading across the state. The Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, is warning pilots about them. The FAA told Bloomberg that it's investigating possible jamming of the GPS that aircraft use to guide them to runways and during their flights. A runway at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport was shut down temporarily over the disruptions. The FAA says so far it has found no evidence of intentional interference, but the agency didn't say what might be the cause. Flight tracking website ADSB first reported GPS interference around Dallas on Monday. The website also reported interference near Waco, Texas, and the Fort Hood military base the next day. The founder of the website told Bloomberg that such interference in the Dallas area is unusual. The road that connects Sanibel Island to the Florida mainland has reopened more than a week ahead of schedule. It underwent emergency repairs for damage caused by Hurricane Ian. Photos show parts of the Sanibel Causeway submerged. Category 4 Hurricane Ian hit Florida at the end of September, killing over 100 people. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced that the emergency repairs were completed in just 15 days. DeSantis directed the Florida Department of Transportation to prioritize the causeway repairs. He said 100 crews worked on it around the clock. The Sanibel Causeway is three miles and consists of three separate bridges. 6,300 people reside on Sanibel Island. The damage stopped cars and trucks from traveling and delayed the delivery of services and supplies to the island community. Now that emergency repairs have been completed, permanent repairs can proceed. The U.S. is awarding $2.8 billion in grants for domestic battery suppliers. This is an effort to lower costs amid inflation. The Department of Energy is awarding the grants to manufacturing and processing companies in 12 states. The funds come from a bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year. It's expected to create 8,000 jobs. Officials say this investment is the first of several rounds. The goal is to strengthen the supply chain and move the U.S. away from dependence on China. In addition, the private sector is expected to match the federal government's investment. For example, BMW, the company plans to invest $1 billion in its South Carolina factory to start producing electric vehicles and an additional $700 million to build an electric battery plant nearby. It signals a transition to electric vehicle production in North America in line with similarly ambitious plans by other major automakers. The 7 million square foot vehicle factory in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains already employs more than 11,000 workers. It's unknown how many more jobs this may add. The new battery plant aims to employ 300, with hiring to begin with a few years. An F-35 fighter jet crashed at an Air Force base in Utah last night. The pilot survived by ejecting from the plane. The crash happened at around 6.15 p.m. on the runway of Hill Air Force Base north of Salt Lake City. The cause of the crash is unknown. The commander of the 388th Fighter Wing said that the pilot was returning from a routine training mission. The commander said, quote, flying military aircraft is a risky business that we all accept when we go do it. A local resident told KSL.com that the pilot landed near his property, walking and coherent. The resident said that he, his daughters and two others sat with the pilot until first responders arrived. Lead has been detected in the water at University of North Carolina. The university says lead was found in fountains and sinks in 12 campus buildings, including residence halls. UNC's Environment, Health and Safety Department has been testing water fixtures on campus after a summer project by a professor found lead in the library. EPA standards require action to reduce the concentration of lead if levels exceed 15 parts per billion. 
The levels of lead detected so far range from 1.1 ppb in a residential kitchen sink up to 500 in a basement water fountain. The university says the process for testing and replacing affected fixtures is being done in three phases and is expected to take multiple weeks. Lead generally gets into drinking water when plumbing materials containing the metal start to corrode. A Missouri school board decided to shut down a grade school that sits near a contaminated creek. That's after a study found high levels of radioactive material inside the school. Contamination was in classrooms, the playground, and elsewhere at Jana Elementary School in Florissant, Missouri. It follows another study by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That study found contamination stemming from World War II-era nuclear weapons production near Coldwater Creek. The Hazelwood Board of Education voted Tuesday to close the school until it can be cleaned up. Virtual learning will start Monday and will continue until students can be moved to different schools. It's unclear when Jana Elementary will reopen. Pasta brand Berea is facing a class action lawsuit over its slogan. A federal judge ruled that there is enough of a case that the suit can proceed. At issue is the brand's slogan, Italy's number one brand of pasta. The lawsuit claims the slogan can lead customers to believe it's actually made in Italy. The two customers who filed the lawsuit said they brought multiple boxes of Berea pasta thinking they were made in Italy. But the pasta is made in Iowa and New York using the same type of machines used at its plant in Parma, Italy, where the company was founded in 1877. The judge ruled the pair suffered economic injury and presented enough evidence that they wouldn't have bought Berea if they knew it wasn't made in Italy. As the water levels of the Mississippi River drops from the recent drought, a historic shipwreck is revealed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Let's take a look. With water in Lake Mead National Recreation Area receding from the ongoing drought, part of this 90-foot vessel emerged along the muddy shoreline. Archaeologists believe it to be the Brook Hill Ferry that sank during a storm in 1915. The Mississippi River was a major avenue of commerce throughout the 1700s, 1800s and into the 1900s. And Baton Rouge was a major port uh, for those goods. And there was a wharf right here, the Main Street Wharf, which was one of the main landing points uh, for ships putting in. Earlier this month, a Baton Rouge resident spotted the ship while strolling nearby. The discovery is the latest to surface from the ebbing waters this year. There's just so much history here. We can't just drive across the bridge worrying about getting somewhere else without understanding what this river means. It's uh, it's our lifeblood and has been for many years. This isn't the first time low water has exposed the ship. There was a previous drought in 1992 and she became known at that time but at that particular time, all you could see was the very tops of the sides. Uh, she was completely full of mud, and the mud had caked all around her, so there wasn't really much to see. Archaeologists are working to document the wreck, given that the river will eventually rise back up. But for now, more findings are expected as water continues to fall. According to the National Weather Service, the river in Baton Rouge rests at about five feet deep, the lowest level since 2012. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, the U.S. military is weak, according to an American think tank. Experts break down why that may be and how adversaries are reacting. And a girl in China dies in a quarantine center. Authorities ignored her medical condition. The tragedy has led to outrage. We'll have the details soon when we return. Welcome to RenBiz.com, the education and career program where parents rule. We replace public schools and universities. We are for ages 6 to 100. Never any big student loans with us. You graduate with a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic and career opportunities for their kids. At Business Acation, you spend 50% of your time on traditional education and 50% on business education, including setting up your own family business. Learning is in your small in-person pods of six to 10 students. At Renaissance Business Acation, AKA RenBiz.com, graduation means you have a degree and your own family business. Like education always should have been, 
a transition to getting a career. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and my employees and I want to thank each and every one of you for your continued support. With everything going on right now, your rest is so important. That's why we're having the biggest my pillow sale ever. Not only are my bed pillows as low as $19.98, but you can get the best body pillows ever. Regular $89.98, now only $29.98. Take your rest on the go with our Roll and Go Anywhere My Pillows for only $14.98. And we have our new couch and accent pillows. They aren't just for looks. They have my pillows patented adjustable fill that gives you that amazing my pillow comfort. In this economy, you get the best gifts ever for the best prices ever. So go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code and you get deep discounts on body, couch, bolster pillows, and so much more, including my original bed pillows for as low as $19.98. Please order now while quantities last. Welcome back. The U.S. government is considering a plan to jointly produce weapons with Taiwan. It's an initiative to speed up arms transfers to bolster Taipei's deterrence against the Chinese communist regime. The U.S. is looking uh, at all options on the table to ensure that the rapid transfer of defense capabilities to Taiwan can take place uh, as swiftly as possible. And consistent with the Taiwan Relations Act, as you know, we have made available various services and defense articles uh, for Taiwan security. And uh, the swift provision uh, of these technologies and these services, uh, we believe, are essential uh, to Taiwan security. The president of the U.S.-Taiwan Business Council said it's yet to be determined which weapons are under consideration. He cautions that weapons makers would need licenses from the state and defense departments. Japan's Nikkei newspaper first reported on the plan, citing three unidentified sources. Taiwan's foreign ministry declined to comment, but reiterated that Taiwan-U.S. relations were both close and friendly. The Nikkei report said the possibilities include the U.S. providing technology to produce weapons in Taiwan or producing the weapons in the U.S. using Taiwanese parts. News of the plan came after the U.S. Secretary of State told a forum on Monday that Beijing was determined to pursue what it calls reunification with Taiwan on a much faster timeline. U.S. military power is declining. That's a warning coming from a new think tank report. For the first time in nine years, it rated the U.S. military as weak. Here's more. For the first time ever, the U.S. military is ranked as weak. The determination comes from the Heritage Foundation's newest U.S. military strength index. The index is a report card for how well or poorly the U.S. military has evolved over time. Criteria include modernity, capacity for operations, and readiness to handle assigned missions. The index said that the U.S. military is now at growing risk of not being able to defend America's national interests. It says that the military is needed to deter America's enemies and must be able to physically impose its will on an enemy when necessary. A former lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Navy calls the power comparison between the Chinese and U.S. militaries concerning. We've got fewer than 300 ships in the U.S. Navy. Of those, there are 100 at, at sea on any day. Of that 100, about 60 are in the Western Pacific. The Chinese Navy alone is 360 ships. So just in numbers, I mean, even if our ships are far better than theirs, it's still a six to one disadvantage. They're operating uh, within 100 miles or so of their coastline. Our guys and gals are 6,000 miles from home. So they've got a land, lot of land-based resources they can bring to a naval fight. We don't have uh, similar sorts of capabilities. So it's just, it's one example of how time and distance and numbers really matter when it comes to forces opposing each other in combat. The Heritage Report says China is the most comprehensive threat facing the United States. The report gives China a score of formidable for its capability, based on its investment in modernizing and expanding its military. The report adds that a few reasons contribute to the U.S. decline. They include years of sustained use, underfunding, poorly defined priorities, and wildly shifting security policies, among others. An expert says the issue with weakness is that all of your adversaries and competitors start coming out of the woodwork. And then, of course, China. If we're not postured with adequate military presence forward, 
when they do their day-to-day -day calculations of is today the date to attack Taiwan and to invade, it becomes more and more likely that they say, yes, that's that day. And it all comes down to having ships, aircraft, and troops proximate to where the flashpoint is. To make the U.S. military strong, he recommends having a clear strategy that works off adversaries' weaknesses, as well as predictability in budgets. A 16-year-old girl reportedly died in a Chinese quarantine center after authorities ignored her family's request for medical assistance. Here are the details. The incident took place over the weekend in central China's Ruzhou city. The girl's death has led to widespread anger in China, with videos spreading across social media. One clip shows the teenager in a quarantine center. She appears to be ill, struggling to breathe and convulsing. The girl died the following day in a hospital. Another video shows a woman claiming to be the girl's aunt. She says her niece died after developing a fever, experiencing convulsions and vomiting, but no medical attention was provided. Thousands of people were reportedly quarantined in Ruzhou City in recent weeks, including six members of the girl's family. The girl's aunt said her niece was not sick when she first arrived. China's stringent zero-COVID-19 policy has led some Chinese citizens to fear forced quarantine, even if they have not contracted the virus. Just ahead, Israel could offer to develop an air raid early warning system for Ukraine, but the country would not provide Ukraine with any weapons. Oil refinery staff in France are returning to work after a months-long strike. Drivers have suffered under the gas disruptions. More shortly here on NTD News Today. Five Russians were charged for smuggling microchips from the U.S. to Russia's military. The defendants used a front company to purchase components like advanced semiconductors and microprocessors. These types of components are used in a variety of weapon systems, including fighter jets, missile systems, and ammunition. The indictment says some of the smuggled components were discovered in Russian weapons found in Ukraine. One of the defendants, who acted as the CEO of the front company, is accused of traveling to the U.S. in 2019 to obtain parts that are now used in Russian fighter jets. Two oil traders for Venezuela were also charged in the case. The defendants helped smuggle hundreds of millions of barrels of Venezuelan oil to Russia and China. And turning our attention to the war in Ukraine, Israel is suggesting that it could help Ukrainians develop an air raid warning system for civilians. Maybe we can support them with an early warning system that will allow them to alert the right population in a more accurate manner, which will then allow them to have some kind of life, long, long, uh, long perspective, uh, I would say, emergency routine. Israel has a radar network that sets off sirens or cell phone alerts to warn citizens to take cover when missiles are launched. The country could offer similar early warning technologies to Ukraine. Israel has asked Ukraine to share information about their needs for air defense alerts. This offer signals a softening of Israel's policy in the war in Ukraine, but Israel again made it clear that it would not support Ukraine with any weapons. Israel has limited its assistance to Ukraine to humanitarian relief. Ukraine is now asking for systems that could shoot down drones used by Russia. Drivers in France are getting a break. Oil refinery staff have agreed to return to work today after nearly a month off over a labor dispute. Here's the story. Relief is in sight for French drivers as workers at Total Energy ended their strikes at all but two refineries in France on Thursday, a union representative told Reuters. It follows nearly four weeks of disruption to supply, long lines at gas stations and frayed nerves across the country. About one in five petrol stations in France is still grappling with the shortages. But things have been improving since the government increased imports and ordered some depot staff to return to work. Morning staff at Total Energy La Med refinery and at a storage site in Dunkirk chose to resume work, the CGT union representative said. The same decision was taken at the Donge refinery on Wednesday. Total Energy struck a wage agreement with a majority of its unions earlier this month. 
Workers will get an average pay rise of 7% next year, according to the company. The hardline CGT union wanted 10% and did not approve the deal. But the appetite to stay on strike appeared to wane. Only morning staff at the Normandy and Faisan refineries would stay off work, pending a vote at the start of the next shift. Romania intends to stop mining coal by 2032 at the latest. The country is making a shift to nuclear power and other lower emission sources. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Romania started closing its heavily subsidized and unprofitable coal mines soon after the collapse of communism in 1989, years before greening the economy was part of the political agenda in this part of Europe. Now, a few active mines provide a livelihood for about 3,000 people, but they're scheduled to close in the coming years. At the moment, we are in a deep crisis that is being talked about now and will go on for many years. Opening a mine takes between five to seven years. If it took longer to close it, then it takes even longer to reopen it. And then it means we have to restart the whole mining industry, which is very difficult. Coal demand is expected to decline in the long term. But there's been a resurgence in Europe in recent months, with old coal plants being turned back on. The country's energy minister hopes the state hydropower producer Hydroelectrica can increase power after a very dry summer. There was a drought that affected practically all of Europe and hit our hydropower production. But the good news is that from next week, the Danube levels will begin to rise. So little by little, hydropower is recovering. And I think hydropower continues to have a sufficiently long future in Romania. Romania is also building several small nuclear reactors. The country announced last year it will partner with American company New Scale Power as part of its efforts to boost low-emission power sources. We are in a straight line with the construction for nuclear power reactors 3 and 4. Together with our partners from the United States, we are implementing the New Scale, a small modular reactor in Deutschesti. It will be the first modular reactor outside the United States in Romania. In Deutschesti and along with it, we will also develop a regional production hub for modular reactor components. Romania's sole nuclear power producer currently has two reactors, which account for roughly one-fifth of the country's power. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A new law in Spain addresses the legacy of the Franco dictatorship from the last century. The legislation abolishes all convictions for political, ideological, and religious reasons. The so-called democratic memory law will close gaps in the previous memory law, covering a broader range of victims and crimes. Under the new bill, the state will also facilitate the search of victims buried in mass graves. The Spanish government estimates that over 110,000 civilians are missing, possibly killed by Franco's forces during the war and throughout the dictatorship. The new law also requires that the study of Francoist legacy be included in school curricula and in civil service hiring. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, for decades, sewage and garbage have collected in a volley in Gaza. Now, a new United Nations project aims to clean up the river and turn it into a nature park. And the latest report from the World Wildlife Fund, it says wildlife populations around the world have plummeted by almost 70% over the last 50 years. Stay tuned for the details in just a minute. As Americans, it seems like other people have been telling us what to do, how to live, and how to think. But that's not how we founded the greatest nation on Earth. During times of powerlessness, we found power. And we found power through taking action. Through action, we find solutions. And through solutions, we find freedom. The supply shortage has made it harder than ever to keep your shooting skills sharp at the range. Introducing Strikeman, a laser firearm training system that allows you to practice your shooting skills at home without wasting a dime on ammo. Using our laser cartridge, target, phone mount, and award-winning phone app, become a proficient shooter in under two weeks. Create training templates with firearm drills and get live feedback with progress tracking on your shot accuracy and shot times. Beat personal records and compete with friends and family to crown the best shooter in the group. 
Put the power back in your hands with Strikeman. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable. Our government is in shambles, and the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals. Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Good to have you back with us. British luxury department store Harrods was targeted by climate activists. A video on social media shows protesters spraying orange paint on the windows of the shop in London. The video is sourced from the Just Stop Oil campaign group. The organization bills itself as a coalition working to end the development and production of fossil fuels. Group members have been protesting in the British capital for the past two weeks. Another video shows 20 protesters blocking a road in central London on the same day before local police arrived to restore order. Witnesses said people were taken away in cuffs. New Zealand farmers gathered in city and town centers across the country protesting the government's plan to tax agricultural emissions. Last week, the government confirmed plans to tax agricultural gases and biogenic methane, which mainly comes from cow and sheep burps. The proposed plan is currently in a consultation phase. It's been criticized by farming groups worried about how the proposal accounts for on-farm forestry and what can offset such emissions. What's being proposed, especially around the emission tax, it's just going to wipe out a huge percentage of the agricultural um, community. Uh, It's going to make uh, what I would call the mum and dad farmers, um, they're just not going to be able to afford to do it. And then to see all that um, good arable land converted into what I'd call carbon credits and just planting it in pine trees is just absolutely nuts. Um, As the government's throwing too many taxes at them and it's absolutely going to destroy our community. They're the backbone of New Zealand. We need the farmers and all this overtaxing and it's just got to stop. The plan has also raised concerns about how emissions will be priced and how the program will be governed. A new United Nations project could transform a polluted valley in Gaza into a nature park. The narrow coastal strip is part of the journey for millions of migratory birds. Entity's Andrew Thomas has more on the initiative. This is Wadi Gaza, a valley in the center of the Gaza Strip. For decades, it's been a collection point for sewage and garbage. Now, the ancient waterway has become a stretch of contaminated soils, trash, and pollution. But this could all change soon thanks to a $66 million project. A new United Nations program is underway to transform the valley into a nature park. For the last three months we have been uh, processing the removal of the solid waste uh, from Wadi Gaza uh, and cleaning up the site. Uh, By now we have removed 15,000 tons of uh, waste. Uh, By February 2023, 60,000 tons of waste will be fully removed uh, from Wadi Gaza. After bulldozers and shovels do the heavy work, the plan is to slowly plant trees, build trails, and treat the contaminated soil. Then gates from a wastewater treatment facility will open, allowing clean water to fill the valley. In Gaza, you do not have too many opportunities to spend uh, uh, your free time with the family in a safe space. Therefore, by developing this ecosystem, developing the valley, Uh, cleaning it up and developing the necessary uh, infrastructure, this can serve as an important spot for recreational activities. Every day, streams like Wadi Gaza deliver over 25 million gallons of polluted wastewater into the Mediterranean Sea, according to the Palestinian Environmental Quality Authority. 
My main suffering is because of mosquitoes. Since the sewage line was moved here, at night, there is no sleep at all. Mosquitoes spread like crazy here. After the project is completed, there will be public spaces like picnic zones, archaeological sites, and bird watching towers. The plan also includes economic projects to help incentivize environmental stewardship. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A report by the World Wildlife Fund reveals dramatic declines in animal populations over the past half century. It warns of a massive loss of animal biodiversity worldwide. Let's hear what some experts have to say. In 50 years, the world lost a significant amount of its wildlife. With the release of the Living Planet Report this week, scientists from the Zoological Society of London and the World Wildlife Fund sound an alarm about the health of Mother Nature. The report says um, there's a 69% drop in monitored vertebrate wildlife populations, uh, and some of those vertebrates are uh, dropping even more. British scholar John Lovett says the drop in animal populations is a barometer of wider problems affecting our environment. Uh, monitored fresh water populations drop by an average of 83 percent. You know, these, these are huge numbers. Uh, and yes, uh, we really ought to be concerned. This pink river dolphin of the Brazilian Amazon is one of the species under grave threat among the whale sharks, tiger sharks, European sturgeons and others. The joint biennial report highlights 10 high priority areas, including the Himalayas, the east coast of Australia, the dry forests of Madagascar, and more. Dr. Rebecca Shaw says the Living Planet Report is the most comprehensive wildlife analysis. There are 32,000 populations globally and over 5,000 species that are monitored. So it's quite robust in terms of the number of species and the number of populations. The report is a snapshot of the natural world over the past half century. Wildlife territories are increasingly eroded by human settlement, especially by activities like deforestation and agricultural pollution. We are uh, deforesting the planet at a rapid rate to produce more and more food, even though 40% of all food produced is actually wasted. So a lot of that, a lot of that inefficiency has an impact on the natural environment and therefore these species are suffering. Dwindling animal populations are also a barometer of other issues plaguing our ecosystems, like changes in rainfall regimes and drought in many regions. But the news isn't all gloom and doom. Action is being taken around the globe to reverse the decline. One success is a program to save loggerhead turtles in Cyprus. Cyprus, we have, a, we have an increase in uh, loggerhead turtles because people are protecting the loggerhead turtle nests. They're uh, relocating those nests, making sure that foxes can't get to them. So where communities care, different big things are happening. Dr. Shaw says she hopes for more action across the globe to protect the species of the planet. But one whale, at least, is able to swim a little better now. Drone footage captured this remarkable effort off the coast of British Columbia in Canada. Local fishermen helped untangle a rope caught on the whale. In the footage, several whales are swimming along, one of them with a long buoy rope trailing from its mouth. After receiving multiple reports, Fisheries and Oceans Canada followed up on the entangled animal. A rescue team soon arrived, aided by locals. After patient work from the boat, the rope was successfully removed. Rescuers said the humpback whale was originally alone, but two other animals came to its company for most of the rescue. The heaviest bony fish, a giant three-ton sunfish, was discovered in the Azores archipelago in Portugal. The animal was found dead, floating near Filial Island in December, but the details of the discovery were just published by the Journal of Fish Biology. Measuring over 10 feet long and almost 12 feet tall, it had to be weighed with special crane scale given its hefty size. The bony fish has been buried in the natural park of Filial Island. And still to come, paramedics may soon have travel capabilities like Iron Man. A real-life jet suit can fly through wind and even up a mountain. Details to come on NTD News Today. An Iron Man-style jet suit may soon be used to get to mountain rescue casualties faster. A helicopter paramedic training to fly used it in strong winds and rain for the first time earlier this month. Jamie Walsh, an emergency paramedic with a Great North Air Ambulance Service, 
has been helping to test the technology's suitability for use by paramedics while learning to fly. Oh, we've had probably about eight, nine days worth of training uh, to get to a point now where we're in a position to actually reach a casualty on a mountainside in Cumbria is really exciting. The test flight in England's Northern Lake District took place in heavy rain and with winds gusting at more than 30 miles per hour. Uh, countering the wind is when you're coming up over a ridge line is sometimes a little bit difficult but actually if you're expecting it it's a very stable piece of equipment and, and you can counter it and, and maneuver it and manage it quite safely. The jet suit from Gravity Industries has been in development since 2017. The latest 3D printed version has two mini jet engines on each arm and three in the backpack. It can reach speeds in excess of 85 miles per hour at more than 12,000 feet, although for safety reasons they normally hug the terrain at much slower speeds. So what we've really learned as, as a really a jet suit company is that paramedic response is all about getting to the side of that critical care patient super fast, a bit like a paramedic on a motorbike. Earlier in the year, Browning flew up a mountain that takes around two hours to walk, completing the 750 metre climb over a two kilometre distance in just three minutes, 40 seconds. Our ability to get over any terrain in almost any weather and get alongside that casualty, often faster than a helicopter or on foot, that's turned out to be super valuable. Gravity Industries is also working with elite and special forces, including at sea. Last month, they flew off the back of the Royal Navy's aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth in New York Harbor. 3D printed rockets. They're real and they'll soon be tested at NASA's Cine Space Center in Mississippi. Relativity Space has already built the largest metal 3D printers in the world. Now they plan to operate one of the largest rocket engine test facilities in the U.S. Relativity plans to use over 150 additional acres within the Stennis campus. At the new facilities, the 3D-printed Aeon-R engines will be tested for the fully reusable 3D-printed rocket Terran-R. Relativity has already cleared land for several new engine test engine for nev- several new engine test stands, a full-scale second stage stand, office buildings, and a vehicle hangar. Parts of the engine are already in development, and the full Aeon-R engine could be tested as soon as late 2023. Did you know that exercising before breakfast may provide you with substantial health benefits? Here's Gina Marie who brings us Strong Mind and Body. There's been confusion regarding the pros and cons of eating before or after exercise. A recent study at a university in the UK clarifies this difference. It shows that exercising before breakfast can have a significant positive impact. The study was done over a six-week period and took 30 men classified as overweight or obese. Researchers examined three groups, those who ate before exercise, those who ate after exercise, and a control group who made no changes. Both groups who exercised before and after did not have significant weight loss. But those who ate after workouts increased their body's ability to respond to insulin. The same group, those who ate after exercise, saw more fat burned and general improvements in their overall health. Men who exercised before eating burned double the amount of fat. The group eating breakfast before had a rest and digest period first, then they took to the stationary bike for 60 minutes of cycling. The group eating after had breakfast immediately after the same exercise. Breath and blood samples were collected at the halfway point and also completion. This was to determine which fuels the body utilized to power the cyclist. It showed moderate intensity exercise before breakfast can help to regulate insulin, regulate blood sugar and burn more fat. Those eating breakfast before exercise saw no changes in insulin response. The co-author of the study noted it is not recommended to participate in high-intensity workouts on an empty stomach. Whether women can benefit and the long-term effects have yet to be studied. It looks like exercising before breakfast is the way to go. NASA's Webb Telescope has captured a jaw-dropping image of the iconic Pillars of Creation. This spectacular celestial formation is 6,500 light-years away where new stars are formed. It was first imaged by the Hubble Telescope in 1995. 
The James Webb Space Telescope's near-infrared camera captured the pillars of creation in a way they've never been seen before. Although the arches and spires look solid, they're actually semi-transparent clouds of gas and dust and are ever-changing. NASA hopes that after studying the formation, they'll have a better understanding of how stars are formed. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform. So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.